It's time for another warm up. Let's get going. Which antihypertensive is associated with each of the following adverse effects? So first dose orthostatic hypotension should make you think uh, especially of the zosins like prazosin and doxazosin. Hypertrichosis associated with minoxidil. Dry mouth sedation, severe rebound hypertension, think of clonidine. Bradycardia and asthma exacerbation. That's gonna be beta blockers, especially the non-selective beta blockers. Uh, that's one reason we more commonly use the cardioselective beta blockers like atenolol or metoprolol. Next, what is the first line pharmacotherapy for idiopathic intracranial hypertension? That's gonna be acetazolamide. Next, what is Todd's paralysis? So Todd's paralysis is post-ictal hemiparesis, so a hemiparesis following a seizure, which usually lasts about 15 hours, but not more than 24 hours. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. In this video and the next one, we're gonna discuss various electrolyte disorders, starting with hyponatremia, which is very high yield, and you're gonna see a lot of it clinically. Hyponatremia is defined as a serum sodium less than 135, although it's usually not a significant clinical problem until the serum sodium gets below around 120. So you may let patients run around with serum sodium 132 all the time. You might work it up, but you're not gonna panic until it gets down to around the 120 or 125 range. Now the key to understanding sodium balance and hyponatremia is to remember that serum sodium reflects fluid balance, not the total body sodium content. So in many cases, low serum sodium means the patient is volume expanded. Now, there are lots of things that cause hyponatremia. The differential is huge, and it's kind of daunting. This is one of those internal medicine topics that drives students crazy, and attendings love to pimp you on it, so you really need to know this. And it's about a four-star topic for step two. When you're working up a patient with hyponatremia, the very first step is to measure the serum osmolality. On the far right, if the serum osmolality is high, you have to wonder why. Serum osmolality is usually determined by the serum sodium, but here the sodium is low while the osmolality is high. So there's something other than sodium in the blood that's increasing the serum osmolality. Generally, it's either going to be glucose or mannitol. So the next step is going to be to check the glucose. If glucose is high, that's your answer. If glucose is normal, then it must be something else like mannitol, but something is raising the serum osmolality other than sodium or glucose. If you check the serum osmolality and it's normal, think about pseudo-hyponatremia, either from hyperlipidemia or multiple myeloma. We're going to talk about that a little bit later because it's pretty uncommon and it's pretty low yield. But most of the time, in hyponatremic patients, the serum osmolality will be low. So most of the time, you're going to be working on the left side of this chart. And we always check the serum osmolality, but it's almost always low. Why? Because again, sodium is the main determinant of serum osmolality. So if sodium is low, the osmolality is going to be low. Then the next step is to check the urine sodium. If urine sodium is high, greater than 20, there's something weird going on. If the serum sodium is low, the kidneys should be desperately trying to retain sodium, pulling sodium out of the filtrate and putting it back into the serum. So you would expect the urine sodium to be low. So next you look at the patient's volume status. Is the patient hypovolemic or euvolemic or hypervolemic? If the patient is fluid overloaded, hypervolemic, that suggests renal failure. That would explain why the kidneys are inappropriately spilling sodium into the urine. The kidneys are diseased and damaged. They're not capable of holding on to the sodium, and there's fluid overload. So in a patient with low serum osmolality, high urine sodium, and volume overload, think about renal failure. If the urine sodium is high and the patient is hypovolemic or dehydrated, the hyponatremia is usually due to diuretics because those obviously could cause some dehydration and they block sodium reabsorption. Adrenal insufficiency could also cause this picture. And then if the patient is euvolemic, which is very common, even with a high urine sodium, these patients can be euvolemic. The problem is usually SIADH, possibly hypothyroidism, ecstasy, or MDMA, which basically stimulates the patient to drink too much water, plus it stimulates ADH secretion, so they dilute out their serum. Or pregnancy, where the HCG will reset the osmostat downward slightly, so that the body is trying to keep the serum osmolality just a little bit low. That's usually not a major cause of hyponatremia, but it can happen. Now, what about when the urine sodium is low, less than 10? That's appropriate from the perspective of the kidneys. The kidneys are doing the right thing, reabsorbing all the sodium they can to raise the serum sodium and raise the serum osmolality. So again, the first step is to look at the patient's volume status. So let's start with hypervolemia again. The big culprits here are nephrotic syndrome, 
cirrhosis, and CHF. Think about it, those are all fluid overload states. If you have a patient with low serum osmolality and low urine sodium and volume overload, think about one of those three, nephrosis, cirrhosis, or CHF. In patients with low urine sodium and euvolemia, the hyponatremia is generally due to psychogenic polydipsia. And the last one is hypovolemia. If the patient's had GI fluid losses, like vomiting or diarrhea, or loss of fluid from the skin, and then the patient drinks a bunch of hypotonic water to replenish the fluids, they get hyponatremia because they're losing sodium but taking in free water. You can also see this with fluid sequestration and third spacing, like in a patient with pancreatitis. So this chart is very important. It gives you an organized, systematic way of thinking through the various causes of hyponatremia. Now let's think about this differential the other way. Say you have a patient with hyponatremia and you do your physical exam and he's euvolemic. Right away, we can pretty much cross off CHF and cirrhosis as causes because those are volume overload states. So we've listed four different causes of euvolemic hyponatremia, and we want to predict what the urine sodium and the urine osmolality would be expected for each one. And you really ought to try to reason this out rather than just memorizing it. I can't imagine trying to memorize this. So for SIADH, you would expect the urine sodium to be high, and urine osmolality would also be high. I think of this not in terms of how high or low the osmolality is, but how much sodium is in the urine and then how concentrated or dilute the urine is. So with SIADH, the kidneys are reabsorbing water and they're concentrating the urine because they have too much antidiuresis. In psychogenic polydipsia, they're going to have low urine sodium and dilute urine, low urine osmolality. With thiazides, they're going to have high urine sodium and concentrated urine. And with hypothyroidism, they'll likewise have high urine sodium and the urine is concentrated. The next one is asking about the differential for hyponatremia in a hypovolemic patient. And again, urine sodium is going to help you. Urine sodium less than 10 is seen with extra renal losses of fluid. You're losing volume from somewhere other than the kidneys. So it could be GI losses like vomiting or diarrhea. It could be from fluid sequestration. We mentioned that pancreatitis can do that. Or it could be from insensible fluid loss from the skin either from sweating or if you have extensive burns, you lose a lot of fluid with burns. So these things generally don't cause hyponatremia by themselves, but if you replace free water, if you have vomiting and diarrhea and then you start drinking a lot of water, you can become hyponatremic from that. Then if the urine sodium is high, greater than 20, you start to think about renal losses, including diuretics, especially thiazides, salt losing renal disease, partial urinary tract obstruction, or adrenal insufficiency. So again, the kidneys normally should sense the low serum sodium and start to reabsorb sodium from the filtrate so that you're not losing much sodium in the urine. So if you have hyponatremia and there is a lot of sodium in the urine and phena is high, think about a renal cause. Think about a problem at the level of the kidney. It may not be an intrinsic renal problem. Maybe the diuretics are causing the sodium loss. And then what's the differential diagnosis for hypervolemic hyponatremia based on urine sodium levels? So again, if the urine sodium is less than 10, low sodium in the urine, think about CHF, cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome. And if the urine sodium is high, despite that low serum sodium, again, you're going to think about kidney disease, like renal failure, because healthy kidneys should be reabsorbing sodium, not losing sodium in the urine. So hyponatremia can be very, very tricky. It's one of those topics that separates those who really know their stuff from those who don't. So if you really want to distinguish yourself, be sure you understand this. Now let's talk about one of the most common causes of hyponatremia, which is SIADH, or the Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH Secretion. So SIADH means non-physiologic release of ADH, inappropriate ADH secretion, and that leads to chronic hyponatremia. And there are tons of things that can cause SIADH. Any CNS disease, anything in the brain, trauma, tumors, strokes, infections, pulmonary disease, Sometimes people say anything in the brain and anything in the lung can cause SIADH, but especially pneumonia and also small cell lung cancers. Then there are lots of different drugs, NSAIDs, antidepressants, antipsychotics, antineoplastic agents, carbamazepine, ecstasy, vasopressin, DDAVP. And then there are a few assorted things like HIV or AIDS, major abdominal surgery, major thoracic surgery. So lots and lots of things can cause SIADH. And we've already gone through the labs. You're going to see hyponatremia plus low serum osmolality and high urine osmolality. The urine is inappropriately concentrated because of all this excess ADH. The patient should be getting rid of free water, but instead they're retaining free water. So the urine is concentrated and the urine osmolality is high. 
and the urine sodium is greater than 20. One more item on our differential that I promised we would cover is pseudo-hyponatremia, which I said is lower yield. Remember, pseudo-hyponatremia is where the serum sodium level is low, but the serum osmolality is normal, which doesn't make a lot of sense. As the name suggests, pseudo-hyponatremia isn't really hyponatremia at all. It's a lab artifact in which the serum sodium appears to be low because of excessive lipid or protein in the serum. Sodium is measured as milliequivalents per liter. So you take the patient's blood and you remove the cells and the clotting factors, and that's the serum. Now the serum still contains some proteins like immunoglobulins and also hormones and lipids and a large amount of water with electrolytes like sodium dissolved in it. And for every liter of serum, there are around 140 milliequivalents of sodium. But in a patient with hyperlipidemia or a patient with an abnormally large number of circulating immunoglobulins, like a patient with multiple myeloma, a relatively larger amount of that liter is taken up by the lipid or the protein. So there's less water per liter and less sodium. But the lab chemistry equipment is measuring the amount of sodium dissolved in the water. And since the absolute number of sodium molecules in that liter is lower, the machine reports the serum sodium concentration as low. So the absolute amount of sodium per unit of serum volume is decreased, even though the amount of sodium per unit of water in the serum is appropriate. The equipment is functioning properly, but the reading is falsely low, so it's pseudo-hyponatremia. That lipid or protein in the serum changes the reading, even though the actual amount of sodium in the blood is appropriate. Let's contrast that with a situation when there's too much glucose in the serum. Back on that big chart, we said that hyperglycemia, or infusion of mannitol, will cause hyponatremia plus hyperosmolality. So how does this work? When the glucose is high, the increase in serum osmoles pulls water out of the cells into the serum, thereby diluting the serum sodium. The plasma sodium level is expected to fall by 1.6 milliequivalents per liter for every increase of 100 milligrams per deciliter of plasma glucose above the normal. If normal glucose is 100, as you go from glucose of 100 to 200, you're going to decrease the serum sodium by 1.6 milliequivalents per liter. And then if the glucose gets above 400, it actually decreases the sodium more. It decreases it by 2.4 milliequivalents. And you can use this calculation to determine how much you can expect the sodium to rise when you give insulin and the plasma glucose begins to fall and water shifts back into the cells. So to calculate what the serum sodium will be once you've corrected the hyperglycemia, you add 1.6 milliequivalents per liter of sodium for every 100 milligrams per deciliter of glucose above 100. Now, this isn't super high yield, but it is fair game you might be asked to make some calculations with this. Finally, let's briefly review how we treat hyponatremia. First of all, you need to treat the underlying condition. If there's SIDH from pneumonia or lung cancer or a brain tumor or whatever, or hypothyroidism or CHF, if there's something you can treat, treat that. Very often, you need to restrict consumption of free water. Sometimes we give loop diuretics because that's gonna help you excrete additional free water. Occasionally, we give hypertonic saline, 3% saline, in cases of severe hyponatremia. And in select patients, you can treat with vasopressin receptor antagonists, like conovaptan or tolvaptan. These drugs block the vasopressin receptor, which leads to a diuresis of free water without affecting sodium or potassium excretion. And that's a pretty good treatment for treating SIDH, where the problem is too much vasopressin, which is another name for ADH. And you have to be very careful about how rapidly you correct the hyponatremia, because if you correct the serum sodium too rapidly, it can lead to something called central pontine myelinolysis, or osmotic demyelination. So this occurs when the sodium is corrected by more than about 12 milliequivalents per liter over 24 hours. So that's why we need to correct hyponatremia very slowly. You should aim to raise the serum sodium by no more than 12 milliequivalents per liter over the first 24 hours and subsequent 24 hour periods. So if a patient comes in with hyponatremia and the sodium is 115, in that first 24 hours, you might correct up to 127. And in the second 24 hours, you correct from 127 to 139. So the patient's gonna be in the hospital at least a couple of days while you correct this. You don't wanna correct it any faster than 12 milliequivalent per liter in a 24 hour period. It may go even slower than that. But the faster you correct the sodium, the higher the risk of central pontine myelinolysis, which is lysis of the myelin in the central part of the pons. The findings of central pontine myelinolysis are irreversible and are typically delayed two to six days after the correction of hyponatremia. So you're not going to know about it right away. You may check the lab and say, uh-oh, we corrected way too fast. 
But even if they don't have any symptoms right then, you're not out of the woods. You have to wait several days to see if any symptoms develop. Now, the signs and symptoms are related to the lysis of myelin. It's myelinolysis, lysis of myelin in the central ponds. So you're going to see neurological symptoms like dysarthria or dysphagia, paraparesis or quadriparesis, which could even present as a locked-in syndrome where the patient's awake, but they can't move and they can't communicate. So that's obviously a very scary situation. They can have behavioral disturbances, and they can have lethargy or coma. And just like it took days or even a week before you see symptoms, it takes about four weeks before you see any evidence of this on an MRI or a CT scan. So it's not going to show up right away. Now it's time for the end of session quiz. So pause the video and answer those questions, then restart the video and we'll go over the answers together. First question, what volume status would you expect to find in a patient with hyponatremia due to each of the following causes? Thiazide diuretics, the patient might be hypovolemic or they might be euvolemic if they've been on thiazides chronically. But remember, thiazides are a very common cause of hyponatremia. Patients with SIADH are typically euvolemic. Cirrhosis is generally a hypervolemic state, you know that. Addison disease causes hypovolemia and also hypotension. Hypothyroidism causes euvolemic hyponatremia. Renal failure causes hypervolemic hyponatremia. And then psychogenic polydipsia will typically cause a euvolemic state. Next, how rapidly can hyponatremia be corrected safely? And what's the consequence of correcting hyponatremia too rapidly? So hyponatremia should be corrected no more rapidly than 12 milliequivalents per liter per 24 hours. And the consequence we worry about is central pontine myelinolysis. And the last question, what are the most common causes of SIADH? So any CNS disease, any lung disease, especially pneumonia and small cell lung cancer, various drugs, HIV, or even major surgery. And that's it for now. I'll see you next time.